opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing well. We are broadcasting today via remote access so that in light of the COVID-19 health emergency, we can maintain our social distancing and still bring you today's show. Please be patient if we experience any technical glitches. We hope that everyone listening is safe and healthy and doing what they can to protect themselves and our communities during this health emergency. Wealth Matters is presented to you by Gaslitz Frankel, a law firm dedicated to resolving disputes involving your wealth, whether through your will, your trust, your business, or your investments. For news, pictures, and tips, go to our new website at gaslewitzfrankel.com or follow us on Twitter at Estate Dispute. Our show's hashtag is Wealth Matters. Your hosts today are Robert Port and Craig Frankel, and today we're talking about understanding the IRS collection process. And now it's time to introduce our guests. We are pleased to have with us today, Jeffrey Kess with an attorney with Menden Fryman, Amy McGehee, an attorney also with Menden Fryman, and Brad Gomel, a CPA with Gomel and Advisors LLC. So first uh, for each of you, let's uh, have you quickly introduce yourself to our listeners. Uh, Jeffrey, let's start with you. Hello, listeners. My name is Jeffrey Kess, and I am a CPA and an attorney at law. I've been doing this, even though I don't look it, for just shy of about 40 years. And my, I'm a partner at Menden Fryman. We're a 33-person uh, boutique law firm specializing in business and estate planning, tax controversy and planning, and estate administration and probate matters. Uh, I've dedicated my life to assisting taxpayers minimize the amount of taxes, penalties, and interest that they might have to pay to the Internal Revenue Service, the state of Georgia, other states, and other countries. Towards that end, I work very closely with CPAs and other financial professionals to achieve that goal so that my clients can live the American dream. Thank you, Jeffrey. Brad, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your background, experience, and practice. Well, thank you, Robert, and thank you for having me on the show. My name is Brad Gomel. I'm a CPA. I've been practicing for about 11 years now. I started uh, Gomel and Advisors two years ago. We have uh, seven people all together. Uh, we focus on tax compliance and planning for individuals and many small to medium sized businesses. And we work uh, pretty closely with Menden Fryman and Jeffrey to uh, resolve people's tax uh, con uh, controversy matters and get them back into compliance so they can uh, do their work over at Menden Fryman in the collection process. Um, I think that's it. Great, thank you. And Amy, tell us a little bit about yourself. My name is Amy McGeehy. I'm an attorney with Menden Fryman. I work with Jeffrey doing tax controversy and a lot of tax planning work and a little bit of business and estate work as well. And we just help people get back on the road <laughs> to compliance with the IRS and the Department of Revenue and any other taxing agencies that they have issues with. Great, thank you. So I'm going to start off. There's the old joke. There's only two things in life that are guaranteed, death and paying taxes. Um, but when you don't pay taxes, something happens. So Amy, you mentioned compliance. What a nice way of saying you didn't pay your taxes or you did something wrong. So, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about. Why don't we start off and, and Brad, maybe you can open it with us. What are the situations where somebody has an IRS problem? Well, I would say uh, one of the most important things is for taxpayers to recognize that, you know, regardless of whether they have a tax liability or not, they need to file a tax return because um, even if they don't have the funds to pay the taxes, the failure to file penalty is, is so large that uh, you just want to get something in the system and get... Uh, you know, get the statute running as well. 
Can I underscore that? Tell us what kind of the penalties are. This is something that we see after people have died, where we look at their estate and look at estate taxes or gift taxes and realize they don't have a problem, but oops, they didn't file tax returns for X number of years, and now they have a huge problem. So you say the penalties are large. Are they criminal penalties? Are they monetary penalties? What are they? So the, the penalty is uh, failure to file is is uh, immediately 10% of your tax liability, and then 5% thereafter, not to exceed 25%. So, and then an interest accrues on top of the penalties. So it, it, could, uh, it could grow very quickly. Okay, Jeffrey, you're up. So, so other than failure to pay, to file your tax, what are the other situations that, are, that, that, are, that our listeners might commonly reach if they make a mistake? Well, the biggest penalty out there, and uh, we've seen a very, very uh, big increase in this area, is if you don't file a return, it's a crime. And uh, you might find yourself either in the big house or in the prison camp. And uh, towards that end, I was on a webcast yesterday as a tax study group where I listened to Commissioner Reddick of the Internal Revenue Service and they are allocating their best and brightest, which sounds like a lot, but unfortunately, you know, the IRS uh, uh, workforce is down and there's been people retiring and leaving. So there's not that many people, but whatever people are left are all being allocated to the major priority, which is to find and enforce high net worth individuals and high income taxpayers who have not filed returns. And usually from doing this for as long as I have, everyone's got a story. It's divorce. It's an estate dispute. It's a sickness. It's a failed business. It's something, some life event that has led them to not follow a return and not pay their taxes. There are plenty though, there, there are plenty of folks that do it on purpose. And those are the folks that they're gonna look at towards and they're gonna prosecute them and make them post the children. So that will in effect, hopefully increase compliance for, for the rest of us. Robert, you had a question. Yeah, Jeffrey, you you had mentioned that that on this call or webcast there was an indication of what the IRS uh, priorities would be. Is that uh, common that the IRS lets uh, um, you know the world know, and particularly practitioners like yourself, what they're going to be focusing on for the next period of time? Well, I've been very fortunate. I, I I'm I'm tuned into the Internal Revenue Service uh, Executive uh, Committee very closely, including the commissioner himself, who's been a longtime friend of my family's. Uh, and uh, I am the co-chair of the last remaining practitioner liaison group with the Internal Revenue Service. We meet every October in Washington, D.C., and we get the key executives from all the different branches of the Internal Revenue Service where they disseminate to my group, which is about 30 practitioners, plus or minus, the different priorities. And um, this year, unfortunately, because of the COVID, we had to do it virtually. And uh, we had a follow up uh, yesterday. And I can tell you that, uh, as I mentioned previously, the areas of priority are the high net worth, high income, non filer individuals, the uh, abusive uh, use of conservation easements and captive insurance companies. Those are very high in the list. And uh, an ongoing problem, which you know started as one of my first cases and continues for 40 years is the abuse of the employment tax system where folks pyramid the non-payment of uh, payroll taxes. When you say pyramid, service, explain what you mean by pyramid. Okay, what, what I mean is you'll have a business, could be a small business, could be a big business, could be anything from your uh, neighborhood dry cleaner 
to uh, a publicly traded company. And they'll start off, they won't make their payroll taxes, either non-file the returns or non-pay the payroll taxes or a combination of both. And uh, then they may do that for a while and liquidate that business either legally or just walk away from it and start a whole new business, same name, same like location, uh, same business and do it again. And then when the IRS is on to them, you know, they might have to shut that down and then move to another location. So by the time the IRS figures this out, you know, you're talking hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in unpaid payroll taxes. And, uh, you know, Amy and I and Brad have all been involved in cases where people haven't filed or paid for 25 years. Uh, we're working on one right now, uh, the, in multiple ones, where we, we're representing the parents, and then they passed it on to the children, and the parents never filed or paid, and the children never filed or paid. Payroll taxes, income taxes, uh, state taxes, and uh, it becomes a very uh, difficult situation. I want to highlight something for our listeners, because this is a common question we get. A, 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 you are not personally liable for your parents' debts. The problem is, if your parent dies and you're a beneficiary, it'll take up all of their money. And so you'll have nothing to give you. But you're not personally liable unless you participated somehow in, in, in the business or something. A Amy, let me ask you a question. When we're talking about um, let's assume that, you know, we, I think it's a pretty obvious, though, though honored in the, in the, in the mistake, you, sh you need to file your taxes. But let's say you don't have the money for whatever reasons. What are your options as a taxpayer? As Brad said earlier, you should always file, even if you can't pay, because there's different penalties and there's statute of limitations issues. But if you go ahead and file, just file no matter what and include all your income. I know you think, oh, I got a 1099. Maybe the IRS doesn't know about that or K1. It was just $800. It was just $4,000 or it came late, something like that. You'll get an automated under reporter notice and it opens your, durably open up to other penalties as well. So file every time, no matter what, even if you can't pay, just send it in. The IRS will contact you probably and let you know that you have a balance due and then it will go from there, but you're always better off filing, even if you can't pay, and file for everything, include all the income. So what, one of the things that I notice as someone who's not terribly versed in this area is uh, if, if you watch TV, there are often ads on by folks who make it appear that, that uh, if, if you haven't filed or you under report or something like that, the, the IRS comes barging in your house and they garnish your wages and they do this and they do that. It sounds very oppressive. So let, let's talk a little bit about the process. And, and Brad, maybe you can address that. Uh, we, we have, uh, as I recall from law school, something called due process in, the con in this country and the IRS just can't come and presumably bust down your door uh, without uh, some, some prior due process. So, so walk our listeners through some of the um, you know, collections process and how, how that goes forward. Uh, Robert, I think uh, Amy would probably be better suited for that question. Okay, great. Amy, take a shot at it. Okay, so you, you file your return, but you don't pay. Or you don't, if you don't file, it'd be a much longer process until maybe the IRS notices and it could be much worse. So we'll go with you filed, but you didn't pay. So if the system's working correctly, you'll get a notice saying that you owe us money. The IRS is saying, don't forget, you owe us money. And you'll continue- By, by the way, that may happen if you do pay and they decide that you still underpaid. It, yeah. It's gonna be very similar. And that happens all the time. Sometimes minor, you know, you made a dollar or two mistake and sometimes major. And you'll, and you'll keep getting these notices. A lot of our clients don't open them because they see that, uh, that IRS in the top corner, left-hand corner, and they're like, this is scary. I don't wanna look at this. And they just throw them away or put them in a box. But we would encourage you to go ahead and open them because <laughs> a lot of times they're not as scary as what you think they are. They're just reminding you and they're saying, hey, if you don't forget you owe us money. And then the next set of them is gonna be like, if you can't pay us, call us right now, see if we can help you out. 
start paying us. And they continue to send these notices and people will get a lot of them. And especially if they have multiple periods, you'll get one for every period that you didn't file or pay. So if you didn't file for 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, you feel like your mailbox is full of IRS notices. And so they kind of continue along. If the system is working properly, they'll eventually let you know many, many notices and that you're going to, that they intend to lean or levy you. So a lien would be, it attaches to any property that you own. Most people care about it for real estate purposes, because if you have a home, that IRS lien would attach to it. And there's rights that go with it. And what you're talking about um, taking property is a levy. So that's when the IRS comes and either takes money from your bank account or takes it out of your paycheck and continues to do so. But before you got there, you also got what feels like a hundred notices, letting you know this is gonna happen. Call an attorney or call us. <laughs> and if you get a notice that they're going to uh, assert a lien, do you have any rights to object or say, hey, wait a second, I disagree. Oops, I didn't respond to you the first 99 times, but now I'm paying attention. Is there anything you can do? There is. On the notice, it'll actually tell you that you can request a collection due process hearing. It's a hearing with the IRS where you go over collection alternatives or, you know, try to set up some kind of arrangement. I think it's probably difficult and a little intimidating for most taxpayers to do on their own because they don't really know the rules of what they're allowed to do and what they're not. So most people, and it's in the fine print, like the notice itself is going to be four or five pages. And people generally stop reading after the first one. So, it's so the, the, the point is, pay attention. Don't stick your head in the sand. Um, like, like you, I'm, I'm surprised in other types of situations. Clients come to us with unopened letters that go back years. And, and it, it's easier always to try and unwind uh, something or deal with something promptly than, than letting it fester. So, um, Brad, let me let me ask you: when when someone comes to you as a CPA with uh, you know a non-filing situation, get, tell us briefly how you go about trying to address uh, their situation and cure that, if if that's the right word. Right. So, uh, first and foremost, we uh, we get a power of attorney on the taxpayer. We pull IRS transcripts to determine what if any 1099s are available to the IRS. Um, we pull account transcripts to see what their filing history really is because sometimes taxpayers don't remember the last time they filed. Um, so we, we start there and we typically file within the, the last six years. So if they, if they haven't filed for 10 years, we filed six years uh, of tax returns with the IRS and potentially less with Georgia through a voluntary disclosure program. Why, why is it that you would only file for six if in your example, they hadn't uh, filed a return in 10? Is there some magic to that? So uh, typically six years, uh, if you file six years, the IRS will ignore prior years unless there's uh, foul play involved. Okay, so you, you sort of get, I won't say a pass, but perhaps something like a pass if you filed for six years, but beyond that, perhaps you didn't file as well. Exactly. I'll, I'll jump in on that. I'll jump in on that, Robert. Um, the, the actual law uh, says that there's no statute of limitations. And if you didn't file in 25 years, you're supposed to file in you know, 25 years prior returns. And that doesn't matter if it's income tax returns, payroll tax returns, or any other kind of tax returns. But the Internal Revenue Service has kind of like an internal uh, Bible. It's called the Internal Revenue Manual. And the manual is what all of the employees of the Internal Revenue Service go by. Uh, and it has a section in there that basically says, just like Brad said, unless there's some reason, foul play, fraud, or some other type of reason, if you can secure the last six years worth of returns, that's sufficient. And yes, the taxpayer will get a pass for the rest of them. Uh, and Brad, also just to you know highlight this, uh, 
mention the voluntary disclosure program that the Georgia Department of Revenue offers. And uh, we've been very successful, the three of us as a team, in many, many, many cases to be able to limit the filing of the returns to three years. And, you know, don't take that like every single guy is only going to file the last three years of returns because it depends and it's a negotiation. Um, but I'd say, and Brad and Amy, you're in the trenches more on this one, but probably in most cases with the voluntary disclosure, the Georgia Department of Revenue probably only goes back, say, five years. Well, that, that's why it's important to, to hire quality professionals like yourself. You're listening to Wealth Matters, the radio show where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. We are your hosts, Robert Port and Craig Frankel from the fiduciary litigation law firm of Gas Lewis Frankel. Our guests today are Amy McGehee, attorney with Menden Fryman, Jeffrey Kess, also an attorney with Menden Fryman, and Brad Gomel, a CPA with Gomel Advisors, LLC. Today, we're talking about understanding the IRS collection process. Amy, let me follow up with a question that, that was just started by, I mean, an issue that we just started with Jeffrey and Brad. So you're going to file and try to fix the problem. You're an, a non-filer. And kind of the IRS question, how far are you going to go back, depends on whether I think they use the word foul pay and fraud. Those are scary words. And of course, the person deciding whether it's foul play or fraud is going to be the IRS, not you. So when you're doing that, it, do you need to, when you, when you file the unfiled returns, do you need to pay? Is that going to hit whether or not they're going to consider it fraud or not? Do you have to characterize the mistake? You know, how do they determine fraud? What's, what's going to be important to the IRS to give you the shortest time period they're going to make you go back? Well, first of all, I, you should go ahead, go ahead and file six years, but occasionally the IRS will file substitute returns for you. So if Jeffrey didn't file his taxes and they had enough information, at some point they might pick it, pick it up and... Uh, file it for him. And that's a terrible thing to have happen because and they're not going to happen like us as W-2s and 1099s on file. Exactly. And that they're not going to give you the credits and deductions, exemptions, things like that, that would lower your tax liability. So sometimes people get those notices and it's actually a substitute return that was prepared by the IRS. So the six year thing is great, but if the IRS prepared substitute returns, let's say, you know, 10, 11, and 12 years ago, all of it's you're starting here, you know, with the six and the substitute returns, and you go from there. And Brad can fix those by filing amended returns that'll fix those numbers. Is there a time period that the statute that says you can only do an amended return for so many years? I believe it's 20 years that you can go back, Brad. But you can go back pretty far. You can go back pretty far. You can't get a refund, but you can only get a refund for what, three years, but the uh, you can go back and file an amend. So, but that wasn't the question you asked. You asked about, uh, they, well, I'm sorry, can you tell me again what you the asked? The question really is, how does the IRS determine what can you do, what are they gonna look at and that you can focus on to say, you know, we haven't filed, we're filing the, the, the late filed returns for six years to get them to only make you pay for three years if you're really lucky or six years, but not the full 10. There's different, there's different avenues you can go down. I mean, you have to go ahead and file. The number one thing you have to do is be in compliance. Before you can even talk to the IRS, really, about your different options for repayment, you have to file. So now you filed and you've done your best job. What does the IRS care about? And I'm, I'm asking the odd question, but you know, you're going to try to anticipate to try to answer their questions. You're getting your ducks in a row. You're telling your client, don't do this again, but actually open the files and listen to me. And so what are you going to tell them to do trying to look in your crystal ball as to what matters to the IRS? I would say what matters to the IRS is start where you are and start depositing. So we have a lot of clients that haven't filed, Brad prepares returns, they file those, and then our clients continue to not pay their taxes. Now they're filing, but they're not paying. Well, we're still, it's harder to put up a good argument, like we're turning over a new leaf, changing our ways, we want to enter into an agreement to pay back our old taxes or compromise our liabilities or have a currently not collectible if we're still doing the exact same thing or some version of it. So if you owe money, 
if you have to make estimated payments, like you're self-employed, go ahead. Even if you can't do it for 2020, start now. Make an estimated payment for the first quarter of 2021 and then the second quarter. That way, when the IRS processes those six years of returns and they pull your account, you currently are in compliance, not only with filing, but with paying. You haven't paid those six years, so we're going to have to talk about that, but you're currently paying the amount that's due. You're making a good faith effort to get back into the system and back into compliance. So here's here's a question for, for any of you, which is, Amy used the word, I, I think, compromise. Um, how... How likely is it, and of course, every case depends on its facts and your particular taxpayer, but how likely is it that you can reach some compromise with the IRS as to the liability due? And, and my follow-on question is, a lot of people might be thinking, well, you know, I all this, all this money, I'm just going to file bankruptcy and be done with it. So can you, can you speak about both compromise and whether or not you can get out of this with, with bankruptcy? Anyone who wants to grab that one? I'll be happy to take that. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the uh, 40,000 uh, foot view and Amy can uh, talk about the uh, trench view. But uh, for your first question, Robert, there has never been a case that I have been able to reach a compromise that the Internal Revenue Service was happy with and that the taxpayer was happy with. Now I say that before we file an offer and compromise, we kind of do the same type of job that the IRS would do when they would examine the offer. And we would tell the client, you know, this is the range that you could expect to pay. Is that something that you could fund? And if the answer was no, then we wouldn't file an offer and compromise because even though we might be able to reach a resolution, if the client can't fund it, it's not a very smart thing to go forth and do when there's other collection alternatives available. Um, and Amy yeah, can talk to have, the nuts and bolts. I, I, I was going to say, um, do, do you have a, a um, sort of a percentage in mind of, of how much relief you can get for, for a uh, client? I, I know in certain of our practice areas, when we look at certain matters, we can, at least in the back of our minds, things, all right, the settlement value, if you will, of this matter is likely to be within this range or a percentage of what, what our clients claim damages are. Is, is that something you can also at least tease out on your own in the back of your mind or is each case entirely unique? Each case is entirely unique. So if you had a hundred people that all owed a half a million dollars, you'd have a hundred different answers as to what the settlement amount would be because it's everything at the IRS collections division is based upon your ability to pay, which everybody has their unique circumstances, financial, health, age, marital status, children, et cetera, and it's always different. So um, between Brad and Amy crunching the numbers and uh, taking into account all the intangibles, we have a pretty good idea of what, what the situation may be. So your, your, answer, answer, your answer suggests to me that one of the things you need from a client is for them to be very complete and, and candid with you about their resources uh, yes. so that you can effectively represent them before the service. When we represent yeah. them or if they sign anything, they're going to sign a lot of documents under penalties of perjury, which, you know, doesn't sound that bad if you're not a lawyer. What does that mean? It means it, it takes it from civil to criminal. So you can actually go to jail if, or I guess would be prison if you're, a, if you're not completely honest on the forms. You want to be honest. Like the IRS probably knows more than, more than you think they do. They have access to your bank account, bank records, W-2s, 1099s, other people's filings that included your number. So it's that's really a perjury line is so important in so many lawsuits and disputes, obviously with the IRS. That takes it from mistake to intentional. You're, you're, I'm just telling everybody that when you say under penalty of perjury and you knowingly lie, it's even worse than the baseball through the window. It, it, it just now putting a target on your back. 
And we can- Go ahead and answer the question, uh, Jeffrey, answer the question about bankruptcy. Can you bankrupt out of a tax liability? This is one of the most misunderstood uh, nuances of the intersection of tax law and bankruptcy law. I'd say that in almost every case, and Amy, you could probably chime in on that, and Brad too, people are astonished when you tell them that you can bankrupt on taxes. Now, it's a very, very complex area. So there are only certain kinds of taxes that you can bankrupt on. So you can't bankrupt on payroll taxes. You can't bankrupt on excise taxes. And you have to have taxes that are ripe for bankruptcy. And like I said, it's a very, very difficult area. But just to give a little flavor, generally the way the law works is if your taxes are three years old, and even that's complicated. What's a three-year-old tax? So you have to go back three years. So this is 2021. So you go to 20, 19, 18. Well, they're not the 18 taxes. They're the 17 taxes that were filed in 18. So you had to have a tax return in 17 that you filed in 18. And then you go three years from when you filed. But if you filed before April 15th, it goes to April 15th plus three years and a day. Or if you got an extension, it goes from October 15th plus three years. That's number one. Okay, so that taxes means that, that you can bankrupt old, that part or you can't bankrupt that part. Only the older you stuff. You can. Years. The old only, stuff. Only the two, time. right, 2017 and prior will be ripe April 15th and subsequent, okay? Um, but there are exceptions to that. So like if the 17 return was due in 18, but you still filed it within the last two years, you're going to be okay, all right? So that's just an example. It's so technical. We work with bankruptcy lawyers and we'll give them the facts and say, is this okay? And, and as I was alluding to, you had to file a return. So if the IRS filed one for you, you can't bankrupt on it. If you didn't file a return, you can't bankrupt on that. But the takeaway for our listeners is that, yes, there are certain taxes under certain circumstances that can be discharged in bankruptcy. Now, what we've also done, and, and Amy's been working on this in multiple cases, is, uh, and I've been instrumental in dealing with the IRS and getting this put into their Internal Revenue Service Manual, and that is when we're dealing with an offer and compromise, it used to be that they didn't consider whether or not you can discharge taxes in bankruptcy. The service would tell you, look, if you can discharge them, go ahead, don't deal with us hire a bankruptcy lawyer and file a bankruptcy. And I found that a lot of clients would rather go through the offer and compromise process and have that on their record rather than having a bankruptcy on their credit report or in the public records or whatever. So I was instrumental in getting that added to the Internal Revenue Manual that when somebody is going through the offer and compromise process, that one of the factors that the IRS considers is whether or not the taxes are dischargeable in bankruptcy in six months, a year, two years, or whatever. And that factors into how much the Internal Revenue Service or the state of Georgia or other states, if you did an offer and compromise under their programs, might want to secure from a uh, potential settling taxpayer. Brad, I want to switch topics a little bit and follow up on some words that were used uh, a minute ago. Uh, an examination. So there's an IRS examination of your return. And I think a lot of us, including myself, don't understand the difference between an examination and an audit. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, they're, uh, an examination, uh, they're, they're, pr they're pretty much the same. A full-on audit, they're going through 
particular items within a return. Um, and an examination, I mean, they, they reviewed the entire return. So from an underreporter standpoint, so it's, it's, it's from a from a from a taxpayer standpoint, either getting a notice of whatever it's called of an examination or audit, it's still just as scary. Right, pretty much. Um, I, I, wanted ask, I, I wanted to ask something, and, and this occurred to me earlier, Jeffrey, when you were talking about priorities. I, I I saw a study recently which suggested that more audits are done, actually, in in. Um, you know, by census data, the statistically poorer parts of the country than in the wealthier parts of the country. Um, is, is what you indicated earlier about the IRS's priorities, is, is that changing? Is that because of the new administration? What, or, or do you believe that, that what, what I'm referring to actually was the case or, or did someone make data say whatever they wanted it to say? All interesting uh, questions, points, thoughts uh, from you, Craig, Brad, and Amy regarding the uh, examination process. Uh, let, let, me, let me tell you that almost every return is looked at. The Internal Revenue Service is the largest data warehouse probably in the world. They have access to more data and information than anybody anywhere. So every single return, quote unquote, gets examined. So your return may just be examined where they check uh, 1099s or W-2s. You, you don't even know you're being examined, but it's being examined, okay? Um, other returns may go through what we call the DIFF score. So what the IRS has uh, done over the many, many, many years they've been around is they have all this data and analytics and they come up with a score and uh, no one knows what that score is. It's a secret thing like the Coca-Cola syrup, but it, it, they figure out if, if you um, have this much income, you should have this much medical expenses or this much in taxes or this much in uh, charitable contributions. So, you know, your, your return goes through the system. And if you have $50,000 in income, and you make $300,000 in charitable deductions, yeah, that, that's going to raise some questions. Um, then they also do examinations. One, it just may be a correspondence uh, audit where they say, uh, please send us all the documentation for your charitable contributions. And it could be that simple. Uh, you could get uh, an, an, a taxpayer compliance audit where they pick one issue whether or not your home office is a home office and you have to go into an IRS office during non COVID times and prove that, that you do have a, a, a home office, or it could be much more uh, extensive where they do in the old days, we used to call it a TCMP, a taxpayer compliance audit where they audit every single thing on your tax return from your name. you got to prove your name social security number, bring your social security card, and every single number on the return, or there could be some badges of fraud on your return, and uh, they start uh, with the- That's not like a Boy Scout return. badge where it's a good thing? No, Craig, it's a very, very bad boy thing. So they come in and they, they examine these badges of fraud, and then they may bring in a criminal investigative special agent and uh, refer it over for uh, criminal prosecution. So right. bottom so, line, basically every, every return gets looked at, it may be a touch or it may be a hammer. So it sounds to me like what we're hearing is something that we say within our practice, but keep your receipts. You know, I am now scanning everything and keeping them on a hard drive. So just in case, so I never lose them. L let me jump as we're, we're kind of nearing the end of the show. I hear often, kind of the big scare is not only do you owe the tax, but you owe the interest and you owe the penalties and penalties can be huge. How successful or how likely is it that if you do what Brad says, you find out you made a mistake, you file the return or the corrected return that you can persuade the IRS to waive or forgive or reduce penalties? 
I think ahead, you can answer that. Okay. Um, it, it, again, it depends on your circumstances. If you want to say, like, if all you have is I didn't pay because I didn't have the money, the IRS looks at it a little differently than you and I do. Like, I might feel like I don't have the money but I did have the money to go on vacation to Hawaii last year. The IRS is going to look like, hey, you had the money to go to Hawaii, so you had the money to pay us. So my penalties, not going anywhere. But if someone had a medical event or a divorce or an accident or something that happened that really had to take priority over the IRS, they're willing to look at that and possibly abate some of the penalties. So... We do that. Most of them go through appeals, but you know, if you have good circumstances, you can get the penalties abated. And if it's your first time as well, if you paid for three years and then you just had a problem in that year, it's much easier to get the penalties abated for the year after those first three that are good. So confess and atone early and often. <laughs> That's what we would like you to do that. But if you can't, <laughs> then call us. Brad, well, <clears throat> excuse me, um, your, your colleagues have been talking generically about how they address these things, installment agreements. Can you, can you share with our listeners so they can get a, a sort of concrete sense of, of how this is done? Can you share uh, any uh, uh, success story that comes to mind so you can actually put for our listeners sort of a concrete example of, of something where, where using your skill set, you, you've helped somebody out? Um, yeah, so <clears throat> I've uh, been involved in uh, many installment agreements, but uh, one that comes to mind is uh, taxpayer had unfiled tax returns for a number of years. We uh, filed all the returns, got him in full compliance. Uh, we had him, you know, prepare and fill out a financial information statement. Uh, which is what the IRS uses to determine the collectability of the taxpayer. Um, and we were very successful in presenting that documentation to the IRS and was, was able to put them into a 60 month installment agreement and uh, they were able to carry on with their business. Well, that, that's great. And presumably you, you, they, they straightened themselves out and you hadn't heard from them since. That's right. Well, we've, we've kept them in compliance going forward and that's, Another important thing to remember is if you fail to make an estimated tax payment, if you uh, fail to file a future tax return, if you file a tax return with a balance due and don't pay the balance, you're going to be kicked out of that installment agreement and you start the process all over again. Hmm. Wow. Well, as we're uh, closing out our show, uh, I'd like to thank each of our guests for appearing and I'll ask each of you to uh, provide for our listeners your contact information, uh, website, social media, or whatever uh, is the best way to reach you so that uh, any listeners who want to reach out to you can do so. Uh, Jeffrey, let's start with you. Okay. Um, my office phone number is 770-559-5575. My cellular telephone is 770-653. 7927. And my email address is J for Jeffrey Kess, K E S S, at Menden, M E N D E N, Fryman, F R E I M A N dot com. Right. Thank you, Brad. Yes, uh, you could reach me at uh, my website, www.gomeladvisors.com. Uh, you can reach me by telephone at the office, 404-223-5900. Um, and my email address is bgomel at gomeladvisors.com. Great. Amy? Um, you can reach me at 770-559-5587. And... My email address is a little longer. It's amcgeehy at mendenfryman.com. So if you go to mendenfryman.com or just Google Menden Law Firm Atlanta, it'll come up. <laughs> and then you can uh, email us straight from there as well. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, as we're wrapping up today, I want to thank everyone for listening to Wealth Matters, where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. 
For more information about Gasolitz Frankel, please go to our website at gasolitzfrankel.com. And remember to follow us on Twitter at Estate Dispute and use our show's hashtag Wealth Matters. Our guests today were Amy McGahey, an attorney with Menden Fryman in Atlanta, her colleague Jeff Kess, Jeffrey Kess, also an attorney with Menden Fryman in Atlanta, and Brad Gomel, a CPA with Gomel and Advisors, LLC. Please join us every fourth Wednesday of the month at 8.30 a.m. here at Wealth Matters on Business Radio X. Mm -hmm.